Take styles of the ancient mutilations, torture, chambers filled with corpses in my bed. Three Six Mafia. I think that we can all collectively agree that Three Six Mafia as a group were way ahead of their time. A quick disclaimer is that in this video, I will exclusively talk about Coop, Gangsta Boo, Juicy J, DJ Paul, Lord Infamous, and Crunchy Black. I will not be focusing on anyone affiliated with the group like a Project Pat or Le Chat, for example. That might bum some people out, but I've decided to just focus on those six people. The story of 36 Mafia starts with DJ Paul and Lord Infamous. These two are related and would grow up with one another. When the two were kids, they were both musically gifted. DJ Paul had talents and such things as playing the organ while Lord Infamous used to sing. They started making music together where DJ Paul would produce and do the occasional hook while Lord Infamous would rap. FYI, DJ Paul hates rapping and prefers producing. Lord Infamous and DJ Paul were interested in quite a few things growing up, but one thing that they shared together was their love of scary movies. Upon listening to their early music, along with early 36 Mafia, this is very evident. In fact, Halloween every year is the anniversary of when Lord and Paul started rapping. This is why I decided to drop this video today with their music matching the aesthetic of the holiday. So Halloween would be the day that the duo started rapping. This decision would ultimately change their lives. DJ Paul would say, We came out the door with an EP, artwork, cover pressed up, shrink wrapped, and everything. That was in 1990. The group was initially called The Serial Killers, and the name of the tape was Portrait of a Serial Killer. After that, I went to the regular mixtapes on TDK tapes. This is what the EP sounded like. I tried to recall the events of the night before. I stand on the hall, the bloody tracks on the floor. Once they keep hunting me, telling me to do evil things, and when I fall asleep, a machete swing. But before I get any more into the video, I would quickly like to plug that I made a TikTok that you guys should definitely go follow. I'll be posting content on there, I'm trying to get that popping, so definitely go out and support that. And if you haven't already done it yet, go follow my Instagram too, that would be greatly appreciated. You guys can always reach out and just show me some love, it's all good. DJ Paul and Lord Infamous had some family that were in a gospel group called the Bogard Brothers that were really popular back in the day. They were the ones who taught them about things such as publishing, how to press up cassette tapes, etc. The duo sold over 200 copies of this EP which they handed out while they were at lunch when they were at school. From that point on, DJ Paul realized that they might be on to something. There were a couple of drug dealers in their immediate family who had a lot of money. This prompted DJ Paul and Lord Infamous to hustle dope at school and eventually scrounge up enough money to buy themselves their own equipment. 
When they saved up enough money, this led to the release of mixtapes called DJ Paul Killer Mixes. These mixtapes would have popular songs on them, but DJ Paul would mix in songs that he and Lord Infamous made. For instance, you could be jamming to some NWA, but in the next track, you would hear Lord Infamous. DJ Paul and Lord Infamous would pass these tapes out in high school. According to Paul, they used to sell these tapes for $4 and the demand got bigger and bigger. Because of this, they started going to a place named SNW Distribution where they would press up large amounts of cassettes and would do it wholesale. After SNW Distribution, they would go to a place called Sam's Wholesale Club and buy cassette tapes in bulk and press them up. In a No Jumper interview, DJ Paul said that at one point when he was a senior in high school, he had around $50,000 and was driving a $10,000 car. After the DJ Paul killer mixes came DJ Paul's legendary volume series, which got up to 16 volumes by 1994. DJ Paul has said that by then, the sound had progressed so much that it's the sound that we have today. But to dial it back a little bit, DJ Paul got in connection with who we know today as Juicy J because in Juicy J's words, DJ Paul was the hottest DJ on the south side of Memphis and he was the hottest DJ on the north side. A man at OTS Records, which was a ball and MJG's record label at the time, for those who don't know them, he introduced Juicy J to DJ Paul. Before 36 Mafia formed, both Paul and Lord Infamous would join Juicy J's crew of the Backyard Posse. That crew did not work out, so DJ Paul said that he regained control of the group and then that would turn into Triple Six Mafia, which in tune turned into 36 Mafia. This is what Lord Infamous had to say about that time period. My brother started the group, you know, and I came up with the name. So me and Paul came up with that together. We came up with the name from an underground song we did around the first time we met Juicy. I just happened to say that in a rap like Triple Six Mafia, in a 44 mag, infrared, and a silencer. And then when he heard that line, he was like, man, that's cool. So we kept that name. The song that Lord Infamous is referring to is Silent Night, which appeared on the 15th volume of DJ Paul's series. This would birth the name of the group. I'm not going to go too in depth with the meaning of the name because people have different takes on what it actually means. Some say that it's related to the group's gang ties, while others say that it's related to evil. I'll just leave that there and move on. The original official members of the group were Lord Infamous, DJ Paul, and Juicy J, as you once heard. The later additions would be Gangsta Boo, Crunchy Black, and Koopsta Nika. How Gangsta Boo got involved in the group would be through her relationship with DJ Paul. They both went to the same school. They came up together in the underground music scene in Memphis. The first song that she ever did with DJ Paul was called Aichifa. This appeared on volume 16, the original masters for the summer 94. Definitely go check that out if you have not already heard it because Gangsta Boo killed it. And if this was released in 1994, then that would mean that Gangsta Boo was around 15 years old with her being born in 1979. It makes it all the more impressive that she was spitting like this at this young age. Crunchy Black got involved with the group because he and DJ Paul both met while they were in high school as well. They would soon build a friendship that ended up landing Crunchy in the group. How Koopsta came into the fold was once again through his affiliation with DJ Paul. DJ Paul has actually detailed how he got Koopsta out of a group home and how Koopsta ended up living with him. I've already detailed Koopsta's story in a video that you should definitely go check out, a highly slept on video that I did that details his tragic life story. But continuing on, the first project from Triple Six Mafia would be Smoked Out, Loked Out. This would be released in 1994. Somewhere around this time period is when people wanted the tape so bad that SNW Distribution could not supply the group's demands, so they had to get a distribution deal. They did not really want to do this because they were making 
a lot of money, but it got to a point where they needed to do it. This is when they went to Selecto Hits, which is a local distribution company in Memphis that was founded by Sam Phillips. For those who don't know who Sam Phillips is, this is a man who produced records for famous musicians such as Elvis, Howlin' Wolf, and Johnny Cash. At the time the group went to select those hits, they did not really distribute rap music, but they ended up doing it for the group, which turned out to be a very smart move for them. The next year, in May of 1995, 3-6 Mafia would officially release their debut album, Mystic Styles. This album would really change the game and still be an influence to this very day. I will say that I fully understand that 3-6 Mafia style comes from Memphis and people who were really big on the scene at the time when they were coming up. The dark subject matter, eerie beats, etc. 3-6 Mafia did not create that style, but they did popularize it and they definitely did put their own spin on it. 100% perfected it to a T. While doing research, I read a spin article that said that Mystic Styles managed to sell 200,000 copies independently, which is quite impressive. Also, DJ Paul would say that he and Juicy J put $4,500 into this tape to make it, and it obviously went on to make millions of dollars. The name Mystic Styles was brought about because each member of 36 Mafia had their own unique style that they would do over these dark, eerie beats. Gangsta Boo described the album as songs that sounded like a movie. They had the gangster element mixed in with the sinister vibe, mixed in with the Memphis sound. According to Juicy J, the whole album was done in a studio in North Memphis on a 16 track. They just went to the studio and made records. If you're a fan of 3-6 Mafia, then you would know that they often redo songs that they have already done on mixtapes or other projects and put them on their albums. There are plenty of examples of this, but as far as the reasoning behind this, Juicy J would say that it was because these songs were just so hot and they just needed to keep growing. For instance, Break the Law 95, which appeared on Mystic Styles, is a song that they redid. And To The Club Up has been redone multiple times. I'll talk about that song more in the future. One of my favorite songs on Mystic Styles is The Summer. This would be the first 3-6 Mafia song to play on the radio according to Juicy J. In the summer. This song getting radio play would be significant for the group because it was a fight to get their music played on the radio. The album Mystic Styles along with the song The Summer would really get the ball rolling for 3-6 Mafia. Later on in 1995, 3-6 Mafia would release the Live By Your Rep Bone Dis EP. The title of the EP is in reference to the song Live By A Rep, which appeared on Mystic Styles. In this song, the group would diss Bone Thugs in Harmony. I already have a whole video breaking down the story of 3-6 Mafia's problems with Bone Thugs and Harmony, so go watch that video if you would like to know more about that. I'll put a link in the description for you guys. The Live By A Rep Bone Dis EP would have songs like Tell The Club Up, two different versions of Live By A Rep, and one of my favorite 3-6 Mafia intros, which is A New Nightmare. At the tail end of the following year, in December of 1996, 3-6 Mafia would officially release their sophomore album, Chapter 1, The End. After Chapter 1, The End, DJ Paul and Juicy J partnered with Relativity Records for a national distribution of their indie label, Hypnotized Minds. One of the biggest reasons why they partnered with Relativity Records, as said by DJ Paul, is because they did not want people to steal their sound. Before Chapter 1, The End, 3-6 Mafia would send a demo version of the album to labels like Relativity, Sony, and many more. The label said that they could not do anything with the group at the time, so 3-6 Mafia just put out the album on their own. 
According to DJ Paul, it managed to sell about 40,000 copies in its first couple of weeks independently with little to no promotion besides an ad in the Source magazine. When it suddenly charted on a billboard, now all the record labels were calling them. They ended up signing to Relativity over Jive Records. In this contract, it was stated that the group needed to put the song's late night tip to the club up and into deep from chapter one on their next project under them. The group was not happy about this, but this is why these songs also appear on chapter two, World Domination. In November of 1997, Chapter 2 World Domination would release and was a complete game changer for the group. This album ended up peaking at number 40 on the Billboard 200, which was 86 spots higher than Chapter 1, The End, because that would peak at number 126. The big song that came from this album ended up being Tear the Club Up 97. This song would actually be banned in several states due to how people reacted when the song came on. People would really start to tear the club up. There are multiple versions of Tear the Club Up with the version on Chapter 2 being the 97 version. DJ Paul has talked about how the song came together. He would say that he and Juicy J used to run clubs. At these clubs, DJ Paul used to test chants that he would come up with. One day after the club, DJ Paul and Juicy J were talking and Paul would say something along the lines of them tearing the club up. This sparked an epiphany and he went straight home and recorded what would be the original version of the song. Gangsta Boo in a Netflix documentary about different eras in rap history said that Tear the Club Up really broke boundaries because 3-6 Mafia were like a black rock group due to mosh pits, fights, and all the other crazy happenings that took place at their shows. The song is just chaotic and caused a lot of havoc during its heyday for sure. The album proved to be very successful with it being the first 3-6 Mafia album to get a certification from the RIAA. Chapter 2 would go gold less than a year later in July of 1998, meaning that it had sold over 500,000 copies. The last thing that I really want to say about Chapter 2, besides it being my second favorite 36 Mafia album, is that with this album, we started to see a change in the style of music 36 Mafia was doing. Their first two albums were a lot darker. With Chapter 2, we did get dark songs like World Blast and I Ain't Your Friend, but we also started to see glimpses of the crunk element which eventually took over 36 Mafia's sound. Speaking of crunk, the genre commonly gets associated with Atlanta due to the most popular crunk songs being from Atlanta artists. However, crunk did not start in Atlanta, Georgia. It actually has origins and its roots in Memphis, Tennessee. 36 Mafia is noted to have played a pivotal part in the crunk movement and has many ties to Atlanta in the 90s with them doing shows in Atlanta during the Freak Neek era. DJ Paul would say, we performed at this club called The Gate in Atlanta. It was really popular back in the day. It was dope as hell. We were opening up for MAC-10 and whoever performed before us sprayed liquor all over the stage, water, whatever it was. So we were on the stage getting crunk, dancing Memphis style, but since the floor was so wet, we were moving even more, like holy smokes. They were looking at us like, what the F are these dudes doing? Then after a while, they started shaking their heads like, damn, these dudes is crazy. This is wild as hell. They ended up bringing us back like a week or two later saying, man, we love y'all show. We want y'all to come back. And I was like, what? For real? So everybody started thinking we were from Atlanta, but obviously we were from Memphis. 3-6 Mafia sound really, really grew from Atlanta, and Atlanta had a lot to do with us. Back to the story, in 1998 would finally come around. At the beginning of the year in February, the Prophet Posse released their debut album, Body Parts. Think of the Prophet Posse as a subgroup of 3-6 Mafia because the Prophet Posse included 3-6 Mafia along with members of their label. 
the next year in February of 1999 is when Crazy in the Last Days would be released. This would be through the Tether Club of Thugs, which was a subgroup of 36 Mafia. The group consisted of DJ Paul, Lord Infamous, and Juicy J. They would have some success with the album reaching number 18 on the Billboard 200. The most popular song from this album by far is Slob on My Knob. Lace on the bed and give me head. Don't have to ask, don't have to pay. Juicy J wrote this song in 11th grade in history class. Slob on My Knob appears on the Crazy in the Last Days album in 1999, but the origins of the song dates back all the way to 1993 when it appeared on Juicy J's mixtape Volume 6. I've heard from some people commenting on my Lord Infamous video that you should also go check out. I'll put a link in the description to that as well. But they would say that Crazy in the Last Days was supposed to be a Lord Infamous solo album. Like I noted in that video, he said that this era was one of his two favorite time periods musically within 3-6 Mafia. This was a personal project for him. The other time period that is his favorite is the When the Smoke Clears era. But 1999 proved to be a busy year for 36 Mafia with them releasing Underground Volume 1, which was a collection of songs from 1991 to 1994. Underground Volume 2 Club Memphis would be released as well, and this is another 36 Mafia compilation project of their older songs. Underground Volume 3 would be the last tape of the series, and that would release in 2000. At the beginning of 2000 in January would come the release of 36 Mafia Presents Hypnotized Camp Posse. This is essentially labeled as a side project of 36 Mafia in which they collaborated with the members of the Hypnotized Minds label, hence the name. Following this, we enter into the When the Smoke Clears era. The album would release in June of 2000. It would peak at number 6 on the Billboard 200. In 1997, Turtle Club Up would really boost the group's popularity, but in 2000s, songs such as Who Run It and Sippin' On Some Scissor would further propel them further. The story behind Sippin' On Some Scissor is a crazy one with members of 36 Mafia almost dying during the process of making it. The recording of this song took place around the time of the Super Bowl that year, which happened to be at the, at the time, Georgia Dome. The Super Bowl took place in late January of 2000. There were two ice storms before it, with the first one being over a week before the game, which caused widespread power outages that affected nearly a half a million people throughout the state of Georgia. The second ice storm hit a couple days shy of a week later, which caused scattered power outages, delayed flights, and made driving dangerous because of how icy the roads were. During this time, just so happened to be when Juicy J and DJ Paul were driving to Atlanta to go to Pimp C's house. He was residing in the area. Juicy J would say, we was driving down the street and the car started spinning because the roads were so icy, the car started spinning into the incoming lane. There was a big truck coming, a big rig almost hit us, and in just enough time, he maneuvered around us. Then when we got to Pimp C's house, Pimp C stayed on this big old hill. We had to literally almost get rope and try to hold each other's jackets. Bun B held my jacket, I held Paul's jacket, Paul held somebody else's jacket, we pulled each other up the hill. That's how slick the hill was. At the end of the day, they ended up being okay, and the song would be completed. The last thing that I have to say about the song is that the group would be extremely nervous about the single because it was different for them due to the song being slow. Previously, they had singles like Tear the Club Up and Push Em Off and they came out with something all the way left from Crunk. They did not think that it would work, but they were proved very wrong. Now, earlier when I was discussing Chapter 2, I talked about the change in 3-6 Mafia's music. Fans began to take notice of this change, and by 2000, there seemed to be a divide of their fan base. Some fans preferred their group's darker, earlier sound, while others preferred their newer, crunk sound. On When the Smoke Clears, there's a song that responds to this, and it's called Mafia. On the hook of the song, Lord Infamous is saying that that devil stuff is still in the group because they're the Mafia. This is one of my favorite songs on the project, hands down. 
Who Run It is another popular song from the album and this is up there with my favorite 3 6 Mafia songs and it is one of the best beats that I've ever heard. DJ Paul once said that he is in possession of the original version of Who Run It which has a completely different beat. He does not know exactly where it is due to him having to do some digging to find it. The original version of Who Run It has keys and has more of a scary vibe to it. DJ Paul ended up playing the original version of the song to people who ended up loving it but he later remixed it and made a whole other version one night in the studio by himself. This remixed version is the version that we have today. When the Smoke Clears with Top Chapter 2 by Going Gold in July of 2000 under a month after its release. By December of 2000, the album would be certified platinum by the RIAA, meaning that it had sold over 1 million copies, which is a huge achievement. I really feel like musically this was the peak of 3-6 Mafia, but it would also sadly be the end of an era. The reason why I say this is because after this album, Gangsta Boo and Koopsta would leave the group. Koopsta would leave the group following arrest on charges of domestic violence, assault, and aggravated burglary. This is said to have breached his contract with Sony Records. After Chapter 2 World Domination is when 3-6 Mafia moved from Relativity to Loud Records. The parent company of Loud Records is Sony. Years later, Koopsta would acknowledge that it was his fault for what happened due to him constantly being in and out of jail when he was a member of the group. Him being in jail resulted in him missing a lot of things. Shows, interviews, video shoots, studio sessions, I mean, you can name it. Being in and out of jail happened all the time for him before 2000, but as soon as the group got with loud records, this was a wrap due to it now breaching his contract. Gangsta Boo would leave 3-6 Mafia and change her rap name to Lady Boo. With this change, she would also go towards religion. In an interview with MTV in 2001, she would say that she was officially not a member of 3-6 Mafia at that moment. There were no problems and she said sometimes people grow apart and basically that's what it is. Some other reasons that were involved and why she left is because at one point in time, Gangsta Boo was romantically linked to DJ Paul, which ended up causing a lot of issues. With Gangsta Boo and Koopsta no longer being in the group led to the question of how will the group move on going forward. After Gangsta Boo and Koopsta departed 3-6 Mafia, the group would work on a direct-to-video movie called Choices, which was released in August of 2001. If you're a 3-6 Mafia fan and haven't seen this movie yet, I highly suggest that you go watch it. You can see it multiple ways, but the soundtrack to the movie is great with songs like Two Way Freak, Baby Mama, and Riding on Chrome. 2001 is also the year that 36 Mafia would be featured on Project Pat's single Chicken Head, which peaked at number 87 on the Billboard Hot 100. Following this, the next year, Juicy J and DJ Paul of 36 Mafia would collaborate with rapper Fiend for their project That's How It Happened to Him under the name The Headbusters. Fast forward ahead a year and in 2003, 36 Mafia released their sixth studio album, The Unbreakables, which peaked at number four on the Billboard 200. The big song from the album ended up being Riding Spinners. Despite the album not featuring Gangsta Boo or Koopsta, it still managed to do well and ended up going gold just three months after its release. Also, now the group would be with Columbia Records, which is a subdivision of Sony due to Loud Records distribution being moved there. After the Unbreakables would come Choices 2, the setup soundtrack, which was released in March of 2005. This would be the soundtrack to another movie 36 Mafia did, but unlike the first movie, I still have not seen this one. The soundtrack to the movie would be the last thing Lord Infamous ever did with 36 Mafia. Sometime before the release of Most Known Unknown, Lord Infamous would be sent to jail. 
Due to this, he ended up breaching his contract with Sony just like Koopsta did. I never left 3-6. I've always been a part of 3-6. I did some time and that was holding the group back and I don't want to hold my brother back. You know Paul's my half brother. They just went on doing their thing and it's like a breach of contract when you go to jail so it effed up things with Sony. It sucks because Lord Infamous would not be involved with 3-6 Mafia as they approached the peak of their popularity in the mainstream. Now it was just Crunchy Black, DJ Paul, and Juicy J. In September of 2005, the trio would release Most Known Unknown. This is 3-6 Mafia's most successful album to date with it peaking at number 3 on the Billboard 200 selling 125,000 copies in its first week. The album would go platinum the very next year in 2006. Most Known Unknown would be my personal introduction to 3-6 Mafia with my dad playing this album all the time when I was growing up. I would always hear songs like Stay Fly, Knock the Black Off You, Pop in My Collar, Side to Side, and Half on a Sack. I was very young when this album was first released, but I definitely remember riding around in the backseat of my dad's car, bobbing my head to these songs. As far as singles for the album, there would be no misses at all, with the first one being Stay Fly. I gotta stay fly. Stay Fly would end up peaking at number 13 on the Billboard Hot 100, which is 3-6 Mafia's highest charting song of all time. It would go double platinum by the end of 2006. How this song came about is that 3-6 Mafia wanted a Tennessee anthem. Due to this, they would bring a baller MJG from Memphis and bring along a young buck from Tennessee. This song is so iconic though, from the sample, the beat, the verses, the hook, the video. I mean, we can go on and on. This song is just legendary. The thing that really stood out to me as a kid though was Juicy J's skull shirt in the music video. As a kid, I always wanted that shirt and I ended up getting that shirt earlier this year and I absolutely love it. I constantly get compliments whenever I go out with it. Very unique shirt that always stands out. The second single for the album would be Papa My Collar, which peaked at number 21 on the Billboard Hot 100. Poppin' My Collar would also go platinum in 2006. This would not be possible without the last Mr. Big, aka Diamond Eye, an Alabama legend. What we know of Poppin' My Collar is essentially a remake of a song the last Mr. Big originally did. He's most known for his song Trial Time, which created a lot of buzz for him. His original song of Poppin' My Collar is equally as good as the remake. Big rest in peace to the last Mr. Big, he would pass away in 2015. Side to Side would be the last single for Most Known Unknown, but it would not chart like the first two. The song that I really want to talk about from this album is Half on a Sack. I originally made this video around this time last year and it was viral on TikTok. A year later and I still hear this song all over social media, which is crazy because out of all the great songs on this album, it's this one that went mega viral. Because of this, 3-6 Mafia would get introduced to a new generation. Of course, they have had songs like Slob On My Knob, which has been a meme for years, but Half On A Sack would be very viral on TikTok and all over social media. But the thing about the most known unknown album is that it would get reissued, and on the reissue, there was a song called It's Hard Out Here For A Pimp. The song would appear in the movie and on the soundtrack for the 2005 film Hustle and Flow. Little did the members of 3-6 Mafia know at the time that this track would eventually make history. Also big shout out to Frasier Boy because this track would not be possible without him. I definitely want to give him his credit because like I said the track would not be possible without him. He does not get the credit that he deserves because the main lead pretty much always goes to 3-6 Mile Figure. But yeah without him this track Hard Out Here For A Pimp would have not been possible. 
the very next year in 2006, Hard Out Here for a Pimp would be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song. The story of how they got to the Academy Awards is hilarious but inspiring at the same time. Juicy J would call DJ Paul and tell him that they were nominated for an Oscar, but DJ Paul brushed it off and went back to sleep not knowing how big the Oscars is. When DJ Paul woke up, he googled what the Oscars is and realized the situation. He previously heard of the Academy Awards before, but he never knew what the name of it was. After this, he would get on the phone with their lawyer about flying out to LA to perform during the ceremony. But Fast forward to Oscar night and DJ Paul's lawyer wrote on a piece of paper the name of all the people that they were supposed to thank if they won. The group thought that they did not need the piece of paper because they did not think that they would actually win. Now it came time to perform and the members of 36 Mafia made an effort to be on their A game while performing because they would have to rap live with no backing track. This is something that they were not used to because at their concerts, they normally had a layer of vocal tracks. For this performance, they had to perform every single word. Performing at the Oscars was a different experience for them because this was not their typical crowd. DJ Paul said that he was used to looking into the crowd and seeing drug dealers and gangbangers, but at the Oscars, it was people in tuxes and gowns. Crunchy Black has even talked about how performing at the Oscars was the only time that he ever caught stage fright. After performing, 36 Mafia would walk back to the dressing room and start drinking. Now they were being told to stand behind the stage just in case they won. They fully were not expecting the win and were about to walk off when suddenly Queen Latifah, who was presenting the award, said that they won. It was a real beat the odds moment. Here was some black hood dudes from Memphis, Tennessee under the name of 36 Mafia being presented an Oscar at the Academy Awards. They were the first rap group to win the award with Eminem being the first rapper to do so. When DJ Paul and Juicy J gave their speech, they were so pumped up that they named everybody beside the people that had anything to do with the movie. George... <laughs> George Clooney would even get a shout out from DJ Paul when George Clooney had nothing to do with hustle and flow. Something cool that I did learn about this night is that the famous musician Dolly Parton, who went up against 36 Mafia for their Oscar, wrote them a letter saying that she was very proud of them. She was glad that the Oscar came back to Tennessee one way or another. Dolly Parton is from Tennessee as well, so it's dope to see that she did that and congratulated them. You should definitely go check out DJ Paul's interview on DJ Vlad where he breaks down what happened at and after the Oscars. Really funny stories and I feel like I could not do them justice by telling you them. Everything would truly change for them because they were now 36 Mafia, the Academy Award winning rap group. And their Oscar win led to many opportunities. In 2006, 36 Mafia would make arguably one of the hardest WWE themes of all time with Mark Henry. Mark Henry loved the theme and it really suited his character. The man was a beast and 36 Mafia knew the assignment. Definitely made history with that one. 3-6 Mafia would also appear on one of my favorite Justin Timberlake songs in 2006 called Chop Me Up from his Future Sex Love Sounds album. At the beginning of 2007 would come the release of the song Doughboy Fresh which peaked at number 54 on the Billboard Hot 100. I remember this used to be one of my favorite songs as a kid. Sadly, when you listen to the song, you notice someone is missing and that someone is Crunchy Black. By 2007, Crunchy would end up leaving 36 Mafia. As to why, Crunchy Black would say that there was a lot of foul stuff going on with him and 36 Mafia. It was a lot of foul stuff going on, Vlad. You know what I'm saying? Paul and Juicy were the business people of the label I was on. They would make me put my own incidentals and all kinds of other slick stuff they was doing at the time, and I couldn't figure out why they was doing me like that. 
it's a lot of stuff that kind of knocked me and made me feel some type of way. If I beat a dude up for you, Vlad, come on, you can't look out for me. I felt like they was doing a lot of stuff that I didn't feel like was cool at the time, but like I said, could have just been me, Vlad. I could have talked it out. Me and Paul was real cool. I could have pulled Paul to the side and talked to him about it, but I didn't do that. I did what a lot of people do, let their mind take control. For clarification, it was Crunchy who left the group, he was not kicked out. Everybody was an important part of 3-6 Mafia, but with Crunchy, he really brought that gangster element. I'm not saying that other members were not, but Crunchy, for lack of better words, just embodied this black Air Force type energy as we know today. But he does credit DJ Paul for giving him a chance to make money in another avenue. And how can we forget Crunchy Black Gangster walking in all the videos? I remember I saw a comment once talking about how Crunchy's style was simple but effective. People knew that Crunchy was really about that life which made his lyrics hit that much harder. After losing Crunchy, the trio was now down to a duo. People joked about DJ Paul and Juicy J now being potentially called 2-6 Mafia which is hilarious but they would go on with the 3-6 Mafia name. Now the two were really looking forward to making a push for the mainstream. They would have a show on MTV called Adventures in Hollywood. I remember watching this as a kid and I've watched the whole show on YouTube not that long ago. Basically, the premise of the show is 3-6 Mafia being out in Hollywood to capitalize on their newfound fame after their Oscar win. I mean, 3-6 Mafia would appear on Jackass, work with the WWE, had a TV show on MTV under Aston Kutcher's production company, worked with Paris Hilton, and did many more things. I highly recommend the show because it's truly hilarious. Everyone on the show, especially Big Treese, Computer, and Sugarfoot, rest in peace to Sugarfoot though. With this time period though, we would see the most drastic change 36 Mafia ever made with their music. Like I said earlier, their song Doughboy Fresh came out in early 2007, which was intended to be the first single for their at the time upcoming album Last Two Walk. This album ended up being delayed multiple times. The recording for this album would be very different and it's evident in the music. The now duo were really busy while recording the album and were recording the album in a whole new environment. They were no longer recording in Memphis where they drew tons of inspiration from the city. They were now recording in a mansion in LA. It's kind of hard to capture that essence when that's the case. 3-6 Mafia just could not catch a break in 2007, especially when Sony refused to clear 3-6 Mafia to be on the classic UGK song, International Players Anthem. A quick story behind this is that DJ Paul and Juicy J made a song called Choose You, which appeared on Project Pat's 2002 album, Land the Smackdown. Project Pat would be locked up when the album was released, which heavily affected the promotion of the album. At the time the album was released, Pimp C of UGK would be locked up as well. He fell in love with the song Choose You and wanted to rap on it very much to the dismay of Bun B, the other half of UGK. He felt like the song Choose You should have been a hit the first time, but he really wanted to remake it because he knew it had the potential to still be a hit record. Project Pat would give his blessing for Pimp C to do this. 3-6 Mafia would be involved due to them producing the song and they were going to appear on the remake of the song but Sony shut all of that down. They would end up being replaced by Outkast. But this is a condensed version of the story but I recently made a video about this song. Y'all know what to do if y'all want to learn more about it. 3-6 Mafia did end up being cleared for the remix most likely due to International Players Anthem becoming a hit. The first single for what went on to be the last album under the 3-6 Mafia name would be Lolly Lolly Pop That Body. It's really crazy to see how much the style of 3-6 Mafia changed in sound from a single like Stay Fly to Lolly Lolly Pop That Body. Fans criticized this change to a more mainstream electro pop dance pop sound. Despite the criticisms, the song peaked at number 18 on the Billboard Hot 100. It would eventually go platinum in 2009 as well. 
What I did not know about the song is that there are multiple versions of the song with an early leaked version of the song sampling the Halloween movie theme. Later on, this would be replaced with a piano loop that sounded different due to issues clearing that sample. 36 Mafia's last album, Last Two Walk, would finally release in June of 2008. It ended up peaking at number 5 on the Billboard 200. People point to Last Two Walk as being the final 36 Mafia album, which it is, but many people do not know that there was supposed to be another album after this. Ultimately, this Laws of Power album would never release. Pretty much after this, DJ Paul and Juicy J were together for a little while, but eventually Juicy J started to do his own thing with Taylor Gang and was now focused on his solo career. We know that Juicy J went on to have a very successful solo career with songs like Dark Horse, Bands and Make a Dance, Bounce It, Show Out, 23, Lolly, I Don't Mind, etc. I can keep going on and on. The dude went on a crazy run with his solo career past Last to Walk. DJ Paul was still active in music and doing other ventures as well, but the fans were clamoring for a 3-6 Mafia reunion with all of the original members. There were talks and this is when the Mafia 6 would form. DJ Paul and Lord Infamous were in the middle of bringing back their Come With Me To Hell series when Lord Infamous decided that he wanted to bring back the group. Basically, this was the group comprised of all of the members of 36 Mafia besides Juicy J. In an interview, DJ Paul said that he looked at it as a new group because it was not 36 Mafia due to Juicy J not being in it. Despite Juicy J not being a part of this, he was still open to potentially doing a 36 Mafia reunion down the line. The Mafia 6 would release their debut mixtape in November of 2013, and this was said to be a sampler for what would become their debut album. Sadly, the very next month, Lord Infamous would pass away, and this would be a big blow to the members of 36 Mafia and their fans. Losing any member of 36 Mafia would be a major blow, but losing Lord Infamous was like losing the heart and soul of the group. You rarely hear anybody say anything bad about Lord Infamous, his legacy will forever live on. The Mafia 6 would keep on going and they would drop their debut album in March of 2015 and by this time, Gangsta Boo had left the group and Lord Infamous had died. Months after this album would be released, Koopsta Nika passed away and this was another big blow. Of course, Koopsta was known for being the wild one in the group, but his contributions musically to the group shall never be forgotten. Another very sad passing, very unfortunate. After this, we enter a very weird time period for the members of 36 Mafia. There were always talks of there being a potential reunion with everybody that was living, but personal issues between members seemed to be the reason why this never happened. Things like Gangsta Boo feeling like Juicy J had a grudge against her, DJ Paul seemingly sending shots at Juicy J on Twitter, along with a bunch of other petty stuff. In 2019, it was officially announced that 36 Mafia would have a reunion tour. The tour was supposed to take place in 2020, but we all know what happened in 2020, which led to the shows being canceled. The big show that I know that you guys want me to talk about is when 36 Mafia did a versus against Bone Thugs and Harmony. This took place in December of 2021. Minus the big fight that occurred, this was a great way to give Bone Thugs and Harmony and 36 Mafia their flowers. After this, 36 Mafia would do some shows together, with one of them notably being Rolling Loud in 2022. A new album by the group would be teased multiple times, but this never came to fruition. Unfortunately, once again, Gangsta Boo sadly passed away at the beginning of this year. Really heartbreaking, especially that there were now only half of the original six members left. I really don't want to talk about drugs because I try to stay away from that topic in my videos, especially when I'm talking about an artist's life. There is always way more to their story than that. So big rest in peace to Gangsta Boo, Koopsta, Lord Infamous, and everyone else that I mentioned who passed away in this video. My message is to simply please stay away. I'm a person who abstains from alcohol and drugs. I've seen how things affected people close to me growing up and I did not want to be like that when I got older. 
If I have any sort of influence with my words, that's what I'll say. If anyone is watching, Dre from Cloud Cancun is telling you to definitely abstain from drugs at least. But on a brighter note, thank you to everyone who stayed until the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoy your Halloween because I know I'm out enjoying mine. It's crazy that no matter how long this video is, it would not be enough because you can literally make a three hour movie on 3-6 Mafia and it still would not be long enough. They just have so much history. All in all, let me know what you guys thought about this video. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.